Good morning and welcome to Church of the Lakes Online. Thank you for joining us this morning. We hope God speaks to you today through the teaching. To help you connect with Church of the Lakes, we have what we call an e-guide. If you go to our website at co2lakes.com, choose the three lines on the top right hand side, then click on what says e-guide. Thank you again for joining us this morning. Enjoy the teaching today and God wants to say something to you. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Church of the Lakes Online. I'm Pastor Mike. So glad to have you with us this morning. Thank you for making time of being here with us this morning and hoping that God's going to speak to you today, today as we're starting a brand new series. Uh, but before I get into that, let me remind you, we do have our e-guide. Uh, so use your phone, tablet, computer, get on here. And the reason we always push this for those of you watching online is because really everything you need is here. If you need to communicate with us, if you have a prayer request, anything like that. If you're a first time guest, there's a box for you just to fill out to let us know where you're watching from. Uh, so we know who you are. Sermon notes, um, small groups are coming up. Definitely want to get signed up for small groups. Uh, for those of you who that live in our area and would like to plug in, they're already on here. So pop on here, check out the small groups. They're starting in September at different times, but most of them towards the 1st of September. Uh, so check those out and get plugged in with that. I'm very, very excited with that. I do want to say one of the things I like to do every once in a while is, is just to thank our regular uh, givers, the people that give regularly to the church. Um, you guys are so faithful in your giving, and it allows us to do so many cool things in the community that we are so, so grateful for. Uh, two of those I just wanted to tell you about. Uh, the Leesburg Police Department is doing what is called National Night Out. And so it's a program where the police department uh, just has a fun night with the community. Obviously, a good bit of the time, the PD's interaction with the community would probably not be defined as fun, right? For either side, to, to be quite honest. Um, but so it's a way just to build community, build relationship. And uh, we're so grateful that we are a major sponsor of National Night Out and uh and all that so thank you for your giving that's one thing and then i'm really excited um both these announcements have to do with our, our local police department but our martial arts program that happens at our teen center uh, that building is going to be borrowed by the police department to do some of their hands-on training uh, so so cool that because of your giving there's things like that, that like this that we get to do within our community to serve so uh, thank you for your giving really really appreciate it well like i said brand new series we're starting it's going to be an eight-week series, so you're going to, we're, going to, we're going to walk through this. There's a section of the Bible that is known as the Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus has this, this moment where he teaches, and he's teaching. Now, within the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Mount you can find in Matthew 5 through 7, chapters 5, 6, and 7. But in that, in chapter 5, there is something that is specifically highlighted out of the Sermon on the Mount that has been called the Beatitudes, the Beatitudes. And what's really, really powerful about the, these Beatitudes is these are things that if we grasp them, then we grasp the kingdom of God. But they are so counterculture to what is normal in our lives that sometimes it, it, like it, it messes with your brain, you know, to think. And so sometimes, and you'll see as we read through these, some of them actually just, they sound counterintuitive. Like, how can this be if this is? And how can this be if this is? And you'll understand what I mean if you've never read them before um, as we read through them. Let me, let me do that. Let me, let me go ahead first and just open up. Uh, let's read through these. <clears throat> Excuse me, Matthew 5. Verse one, now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. So here's what he says, right? And here's each of the Beatitudes. The very first one, we're going to talk about this one today. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You can see what I mean when I say it's kind of like 
poor but blessed. Like these, they sound counterculture, which is why we want to dive into each one of these week after week. So we'll talk about that this week. But in the coming weeks, these are the ones that we'll walk through. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. That's a really good one. Boy, do we need a lot of mercy uh, in our culture. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of anger in our culture right now. A lot of bantering back and forth. And boy, mercy is something we could really use. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. What's amazing about each of these statements is, like I said, and you can already see with some of them, there's this, there's this tension of, well, how does this go with this, right? In some ways, they, they sound like opposites. But one of the, the things for us to grasp as we dive into the study of each one of these, I think, is, is to understand that these statements reveal where joy comes from. So I want you to kind of hold on to that as a concept as, as we're walking through this. These statements reveal where real joy comes from. So let's, let's start by breaking it down a little bit. Each one of them begins with a word. And the word makarios in the Greek is blessed. Blessed. Okay? So in the original language that this was written in, which is Greek, the word makarios. Now, it doesn't mean that you have a lot of stuff. You know, in our culture, our culture is very materialistic. And most of the time, we are we are affected by our culture. So we have a tendency when we hear blessed or something like that, we immediately think money, resources, things, but, but that's not really what's going on. So I read this in a commentary and and I thought this was so good that I would just read this to you. It says this, while material blessings are certainly included in God's favor, the Bible ascribes a much fuller meaning of the word blessed. Perhaps the most well-known use of the word blessed in the Bible is found in the Beatitudes. Jesus used the term blessed in the framework of the Beatitudes to describe the inner quality of a faithful servant of God. This blessedness is a spiritual state of well-being and prosperity in deep joy-filled contentment that cannot be shaken by poverty, grief, famine, persecution, war, or any other trial or tragedy we face in life. In human terms, the situation depicted in the Beatitudes are far from blessings right? Blessed are the poor in spirit. That didn't sound like a blessing, right? But because God is present with us through these difficult times, we are actually blessed by him in them. So the true servant of God is blessed regardless of circumstances because God has favored him or her with a fully satisfied soul. So I want us to to grasp, but that's what we're talking about here. Uh, the, the, The idea is we're talking about blessed as a fully satisfied soul, peace, contentment, um, a feeling of, of, of real pure satisfaction, which most of us are chasing, right? Most of us are craving this idea. And so he gives us the beatitudes to say, well, here's things that if you will begin to work on in your own life and work with God on these things, then you can begin to find that peace, that contentment, that blessed, right? That feeling of fulfillment within your soul. The other thing I think these statements do is they show the potential of what can be ours. They show the potential of what can be ours. Um, we, we oftentimes see in the, in the, in the, in the church, at least in the, in America, I think in the United States that people pray a prayer, and go, okay, I'm good. I'm just going to survive life because I'm going to heaven one day. And I just want you to hear something that that's not what God had in mind, right? We named our teen center, the Thrive Center, for a very specific reason. People have asked me, Pastor Mike, why why Thrive? Why'd you come up with that? And it was because I was tired of seeing people just survive life, right? With a hope that they might get into heaven. That is not the gospel. 
That is not what God has said about us. He did not come uh, that you would just survive. He came that you would have eternal life, but also that your marriage would be healed, that your heart would be restored, that pain would be healed, that, that to put purpose in your life, to use you as an ambassador to this world and to give a joy beyond anything this world could ever offer you. So here is the first and possibly the most important of the nine Beatitudes. Let me say it this way. I say it this strongly. There may be an argument for the fact that if you don't have this first Beatitude, you can't have the others. So, so let, man, let's set the stage with that as we dive in. Let's read it again. Matthew 5 and 3 says this. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so we, we, we talked about blessed, and, and blessed is this, is this fully satisfied soul, okay? So to have a fully satisfied soul is to be poor in spirit. Now, poor, that word, when we use it in our culture, we immediately think of resources, right? We immediately think of someone who, I'm too poor to pay my light bill, or, you know, I'm struggling, I can't buy that fancy car because I'm too poor, but I want you to catch that this is poor in spirit. Okay. Poor in spirit. So this is not about resources. This is not about what you have or don't have in your bank account. This is about what you have or don't have in your spirit. Right. In other words, let me say it to you this way. It's someone who realizes their absolute need for God. Okay. Their absolute need for God. Last week, I had a great um, uh, question asked of me in our Life Steps classes after church. One guy said to me, he said, you know, I notice in your notes, there's different versions of the Bible that you use. And I'm just trying to understand that. And I think he probably comes from a, a tradition or a background where one version is used, you know, or appropriate in that. And so I want to explain that because I'm about to look at several different versions of this one verse. There are, the, the, the Bible has been translated right? From either Hebrew or Greek. And in those translations, sometimes we have words that are really good in, in, in developing the, the meaning, but sometimes because there's a cultural difference here to here, it's hard to like poor means something now that it may mean something completely different within the context of that culture at that time. So often what I will do in study is I will do what's called an interlineal study that you put up several different versions of the Bible, translations of the Bible, and you put them next to each other. And when you put them next to each other, what you can see is, you know, the translation of this word is consistent all the way across these versions. And the translation of this word is consistent all the way. But then you get to this word and they've got a different way of saying it. And they've got a different way of saying it there. Now, when you find that, that's where the original language there's maybe some kind of a cultural struggle to give you the same feeling and concept that they were expressing in the original language. I hope that makes sense to you. So that's why there's original trend. Now we believe the Bible is infallible. We believe the power of God maintains his truth even through that. Cause some people will say, well, then you can't trust the Bible and that's not true because we do have the original language. So we can go to the original language for what it said. But I just want to show you real quick as we're developing this poor in spirit concept and we're understanding if I'm going to be blessed and if I'm going to have the kingdom of heaven, that's, that's what this says, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Then what does that look like poor in spirit? Well, Matthew 5, 3 in the NLT, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him for the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven is theirs. All right. Matthew 5, 3 in the, in the, in the, in God's word version. Blessed are those who recognize they are spiritually helpless. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. All right. In the NCV, those people who know they have great spiritual need are happy because the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Now there's a problem. What we see, what, what we can see that we're developing here is the poor in spirit is a concept of I, I, I need spiritually. I have an absolute need for God within my spirit. I am poor. I am. And when it says poor, this word is not meaning I lack resources. This means I'm destitute. I have nothing, right? I've got zero. So we within our spiritual man have nothing that we bring to the table is the concept here. 
And when we realize that, then the kingdom of God is ours. Then, then, we under, then we can be blessed. Why? Because we understand the desperate need. Now, there's a problem. And the problem is, is that in the United States, we have so much physically. We have so many resources that we've got to grasp this concept. Lack of physical need. In other words, I've got all kinds of things to help deal with the physical, right? And I can sit in my lazy boy or on my place on the couch and I can turn on my TV or I, you know, my tablet or my phone. Oh my gosh, the Wi-Fi is out. I mean, we have a million things physically to distract us. The lack of physical need blinds us to spiritual need. If you have a lot, it's hard to recognize where you lack. Because you can use the a lot to cover up where you lack. And that's what happens in many of us. Many of us here in the United States, that, I mean, this is a big, big problem. We live lives that 99.5% of the rest of the world would change places with us in a blink of an eye, right? In, 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 in just a moment. And so it's, it's a struggle for many people in the United States in the United States because we have so much that it's easy that our much can blind our spiritual need. Let me say it to you this way, this way. We will never depend on something we don't think we need. We will never depend on something we don't think we need. The reason it's so hard oftentimes to evangelize or to teach people the gospel or to have people to become the, a follower of Jesus is because they don't perceive a need for him. I actually had a gentleman say to me not that long ago, I just don't understand why I need God. Like, what, why, why do I need, or why do I need, and he said, why I need religion. But really what it comes down to, he's pretty affluent, has done very well, it's got a big retirement set up, got a nice boat, lives on the water, right? So his physical realities have hidden his spiritual need. And, and, and boy, that's something we've got to be really, really careful about. There's a pride factor in many of us because we can I can, right? Here's, here's something we like to say in our culture. You can do anything if you set your mind to it. Well, let me ask you a question. Can you, can you fly if you set your mind to it? Right? I mean, and you go, come on, Pastor Mike, you're being ridiculous. You know the idea of this. But no, 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 listen to me. The problem is that the pride of my abilities can mask my spiritual need. It blinds us to how poor we are in spirit, right? And that, so that's the conflict. Boy, I remember, for those of you who are old enough to remember, I remember September 11th. I remember on that day, I was at church. Uh, at the time, I was serving at South, South Point Baptist Fellowship under Pastor Ron. And I remember Pastor Ron, and I came out to the sanctuary, grabbed a TV from the kids' ministry or something, turned it on and sat there just kind of in awe. Do you, do you remember? Do you remember where you were? Do you remember... Our entire nation was taken to its knees. Why? Because we were exposed, right? I mean, it, it, was, it was like somebody had ripped the curtain back and, and our country was just standing there naked. You know, is kind of what it felt like. Need was exposed, right? We, we, there was this dust. I mean, people flooded into churches, right? Why? Because, oh, well, now I see a need. Like, all of a sudden, the facade of us having it all under control all of a sudden, the facade was ripped away, right? People flooded into churches. Man, Republicans, Democrats locked arms, prayed together, unity. Let me ask you how long that lasted. Do you know, can I tell you something? Our spiritual need has not changed from this day to that day. Not at all. What has changed is whether or not we recognize the spiritual need. On that day, we had an event that happened that rocked everybody's world and we saw a need. Today, Republicans and Democrats are ripping each other's eyes out, right, in the process, because we're fighting over power and resources and all these things and, the, and all. And I just wonder, you know, we, we, we still have these needs, but, but we're out of each other's throats, why? Because we have a lot that we quickly forget how poor in spirit we are. We, the need is masked. This beatitude says, those of you that maintain the powerful realization of just how much you need God, the kingdom of God belongs to you.
went on a mission trip with a guy several years ago. And um, this guy, came when he came to church, he was hard. He was not a believer. I mean, he was a hard, 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 hard. And, Mr. Tough Guy, you know, big and bad. And he and I butted heads a little bit and over the years. And he is a great, great friend now. Um, but I challenged him to go on a mission trip down to a, with us to Honduras. And he's like, no, no, I'm not going on a stupid mission trip. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, this, the, like feed the children stuff and all that. Because I said, we're going to go down and do some feeding stations where they feed kids. It's the only meal that they get in a day. And some of them only eat half their meal and take the other half back to their you know, to their family, because uh, they don't have any food unless they do that. And he's like, no, I'm not going to do that. He's like, I, I feel like that'd be stupid. And he's like, I've always made fun of people who do that kind of stuff. And I said, really, what are you talking about? And he said, don't you remember now here, I'm going to show some age. Don't you remember Sally Struthers used to get on TV. And those of you are old enough to remember Miss Sally, she would get on TV and she would cry and cry and cry about the children and beg for you to give money. And he said, you know what? And remember, this is an unchurched guy. So a little, a little grace and forgiveness here, right? He, but he would go, um, yeah, she would just cry and cry and cry. But she was a big old lady. And I thought, well, why don't you give him your food? <laughs> I was like, dang, dude, that's pretty cold, right? So I'm, I'm walking through this process with this guy. And uh, finally, I, I, I talk him into going. So somebody pays for his trip. He goes with us down to, to this mission, to the, on this mission trip to Honduras. We pull up in the van and man, there is nothing quite like when you pull up into those vans and here come the kids and these kids, their hair are discolored because of malnutrition, their bellies swollen because there's worms. Maybe they've got a pair of shorts on, but no shirt. And it's the only clothes that they have, but they come screaming with joy and all why to get a little piece of candy to play ball. Can I say something to you that I think is a challenge for all of us? They're happier than we are. And the reason I think is because they're poor in spirit. They recognize their need. We have so much that it masks the recognition of our need, right? So we hand out stuff. We do all this stuff. Finally, I look around and my friend is nowhere to be found, right? I'm like, where did he go? And somebody said, oh, he, he walked down the road towards the river. So I look walk down the road, he's down there and he's just crying, like, 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 just like a baby, just crying. And I said, what? And he's like, I, 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 I can't even put into words. I, what I'm seeing right now. And, and, and later on, he told me the joy he saw in those kids shamed him. That's it. That's what we're talking about today, right? The poor in spirit, not that we lack, you can have a huge bank account. But when you recognize and you don't let the stuff of this world or the size of your bank account or the amount of resources that you have hide the fact that you are desperately in need of God, then yours is the kingdom of heaven. That's what it says. So I'll tell you the rest of the story just for the fun of it. You know, he kind of dogged on Sally Struthers, right? And, and that whole process. So since he went down there, um, um, and, and cried and, and did the whole Sally thing. Uh, I gave him a new nickname. And to this day, it pops up on my phone. Uh, if he calls me to this day, it says Salito Gordo, which you could sort of translate loosely as uh, Little Fat Sally. Um, that's, that's now his nickname. And I say that just because, and, 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 you know, just to be silly and not to be rude to Sally or anything, but, but hear my heart. Like what was happening there was this recognition of what, poor in spirit is. It's not about resources. We have to recognize how often things and stuff are killing our joy by hiding our need for Jesus. Let me say that one more time. We have to recognize how often things and stuff are killing our joy by hiding our need for Jesus. So here's my goal today. I want to remind you of your need for Jesus. I, I want us to go back to a place where we say, you know, for a minute, I'll pull all my resources aside and focus on what it means to be poor in spirit. Now, that doesn't mean I badmouth myself and it's all bad and, you know, sky is falling out. No, 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 no. It's a recognition of who God is compared to what we have in our spirit. First one is this. Without Jesus, I pay for my own sins. Without Jesus, I pay for my own sins. Man, not recognizing that we are spiritually bankrupt 
causes people to think that they have a role in salvation. All right, if I come to church, if I give, if I serve, if I say I'm sorry, can, 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 let, me, let me give you a realization. Without Jesus, if you come to church and ask God to forgive your sins, those sins are not forgiven. And you may go, wait, what are you talking about? Well, because it is not asking for forgiveness that forgives sins. I think some people have this idea that God is like, you know, looking at you and, and because you came and you, you know, you were, you were, I'm sorry, God, and you were sincere. And he goes, okay, you know, I'll let you off the hook on this one. No, that's really not how this works. Actually, let me show you Romans three and 23 for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. So all of us are sinners and all of us have this in our life, but it goes on in Romans six and 23 for the wages of sin is what death. In other words, sin has a bill to be paid. And if that bill is not paid, sin is not forgiven. Well, what is the payment? It's death, which is why we have to have Jesus. Without Jesus, there is no forgiveness of sins. Without the cross, there is no forgiveness of sins. But see, if we think that we can come to God and just ask for forgiveness on our own, then we're misunderstanding and we're not poor in spirit. We're not realizing, I don't have anything to offer here. I'm dependent upon him. This is critical to understand uh, because someone has to pay for our sins. Like that, that's the way this works. The, the payment is not, I'm sorry, or doing the right thing to appease God. Sin has a bill attached to it and that bill is death. And so without Jesus, I pay for my own sins. Hell is the place that I choose to pay for my own sins. And there is nothing that we can bring to that because we are poor in spirit. Nothing that we can do to fix that, but Jesus can. Because with Jesus, I have the free gift of salvation and forgiveness and eternal life. Look at Ephesians 2, 1 through 5. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin in which you used to live when you followed the way of the world. Anybody remember those times when you've done those things? And all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh, following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Why? Because there was a bill that had to be paid. Death is the payment for that bill. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, what is mercy? Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions, transgressions, it is by grace. What is grace? Get, grace is getting something you don't deserve. By grace, you have been saved. Boy, remember, I bring nothing to the table here without Jesus. And so it is the poor in spirit, those who recognize the poverty of my spirit and the desperation of God that is needed in my life. Here's, here's another one. Without Jesus... I just cope with pain and who I am. In other words, you are who you are and what's happened has happened to you. And now you just kind of suck it up and deal with it, right? Uh, that leads to a life of medicating. So we medicate the pain. We medicate, well, my grandpa was this way, my dad is this way, so I guess I'm gonna be this way. You know, uh, we're all just angry people with bad tempers. We got Irish blood in us or what? I mean, we, we put Band-Aids on wounds, and learn how to just get over it. But at the meantime, we hate people and hold grudges. Um, and, and, and we say things like this to each other. You deserve to be happy. That is such an unhealthy statement. Matter of fact, Jeremiah 6 and 14 would refer to things like that. They are, offer superficial treatments for my people's mortal wound. They give assurances of peace when there is no peace. It is not the kingdom of God for you to just survive through this life, right? Pray for me. I'm still dealing with the same issue. Still have that addiction, that anger inside, tendency to pick horrible relationships. That is not what God had in mind for you. But those that realize they are poor in spirit, that come to God in desperation with Jesus, I have the power to be healed and transformed. With Jesus, I have the power to be healed and transformed. First Peter 2 and 24. He himself bore our sins 
in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. Do you hear the transformation there? By his wounds, listen, you have been healed. For you were like sheep gone astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd, the overseer of your souls. Hmm, that last term. The difference of being poor in spirit is recognizing that you are not good at being the overseer of your soul. <laughs> Matter of fact, I'll say it this way. You're poor at it, right? But Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, wants to oversee heal and restore your soul so that in your life, Galatians 5, the fruit of the spirit would be love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Here's another concept as we're trying to recognize our poor in spirit and make sure that we maintain that as a mindset so that we do have the kingdom of heaven and we are blessed. Without Jesus, I'm trying to find or create my life, right? Trying to find or create my own life. Number one question, but hands down, that I have been asked as a pastor is, Pastor, uh, what's my purpose? Or what's God's will? Or how do I find? Or what? Let me answer that for you in a verse. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans. Wait, who, who's, who's I? Who's I? That's God, right? So let me switch that. For God knows the plans that God has for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. So let me say it to you this way. If you're looking for the plans, you will not find them. Why? Because he has the plans, right? That's why Matthew tells us, seek first the kingdom of God, and then all these things will be added to you. Right, And what this world is trying to give you is a counterfeit. This world is trying to tell you that you're just an evolutionary byproduct, right? That there was some goo and that goo grew a tail and, and then eventually some wings and then started to walk. And then the ice age, the tail fell off. And then all of a sudden you, I mean, from goo to the zoo to you, that's, that's, you know, some kind of, and listen to me, it takes way, way more faith to believe that than to trust there's a God, a creator of the universe who created you. And I need you to hear this today with Jesus. You can know who you are and what your life is about. Don't just settle for salvation. Salvation is just a beginning. Of course we want to go to heaven and of course we want eternity. But I, I, I you know, I prayed that now I'm just going to survive life. No, 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 no. There's more. There's purpose today. Let me prove it to you. Acts 17, 26. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. Catch this. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. Well, you know what that means? That means you are where you are on purpose. That means he purposely puts you in 2022 and not in 1822 or 222, right? Or, or some other time period. He has appointed times. God did this so that they would seek him. What did we just say? Who has the plan? Who needs to be sought in the process to know the plan? And perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any of us. Catch this. For in him we live and move and have our being. That is where purpose comes, right? One last one as, as we close today. Without Jesus, I'm living my, my life for temporary happiness, right? Yay, it's, it's Friday, right? I'm all excited because the weekend's here. Boo, it's Monday. Blah, blah, blah. Wait, 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 wait. It's temporary. I got a concert coming up. I got a vacation coming up. I got this and that. And we're looking past all of these things. But 1 Peter 1, 3 through 4 says, Praise be to the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope. A living hope through the resurrection, uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, and fade. In other words, there's something for us to be involved with. So with Jesus, I joyfully live out a life that glorifies God and impacts others, right? The most joyful people in the world are the people who are living to impact someone else's life by far. John 15 and eight, this is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit showing yourselves to be my disciples. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy, come on back to the blessed concept, 
your joy may be complete. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Not, not poor mouthing, right? Not, oh, I'm pitiful. No, 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 no. Those that recognize within my spirit, I bring nothing. I am completely dependent upon a God, and I don't want to pay for my own sins. I, 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 want to, I, want, I want Jesus to do that for me, but I, I need him, right? I, I don't want to just cope with this life. I, I want healing in the process. So we cannot let the resources or the, 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 the status of our life get us away from the concept that we are poor in spirit, that we are desperate. So what's the big idea? Let me give it to you this way. The, the, the big idea, if I could sum it up in, in just a few words, is just this. Jesus, I desperately need you. And there is nothing that I have and no resource that I have that can make up the difference in the desperate need that I have for you to be real and active and moving in my life. Let me pray for you today as we consider this beatitude. God, help us to find this place that no matter what our resources look like, that we understand the depth of our need for you. That we are poor in spirit. We are destitute in spirit. We bring nothing to the table. But it is surely because of your grace and your mercy, your love for us, that Jesus came and died. And, and, and you gave us, paid in full, the opportunity to receive that and to surrender our lives to him to receive that. And then for healing to come, for us to find freedom in our lives from our hurts and our habits and our hangups. But even more than that, that we could discover purpose in our lives and what you've had so we can make the difference that you've called us to make. So God, for anyone and everyone listening today, wherever they are in that process, Holy Spirit, I pray you give them courage to take a next step of some sort in this movement of understanding what it means to be poor in spirit so that we're blessed, so that we have the kingdom of God. We ask it and pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. Man, I hope you have a great week and we will see you next Sunday.